Welcome to Bruce Hurwitz Presents Meets the Experts. I'm your host, Bruce Hurwitz of Hurwitz Strategic Staffing. You can find us on the web at hsstaffing.com. I hope you'll consider us for all your staffing, career counseling, and speech writing needs. I am delighted to be joined today by Ramona Ferreira. We will be discussing the role of fashion and community building. Meet the Experts is sponsored by PK CPAs. PK is a full service accounting firm. They provide accounting and consulting services to businesses ranging from startups to small and mid cap companies to nonprofits as well as high net worth individuals. Contact them today for a free consultation at pk cpas.com or call them at 973 882 8810. They will be happy to be of service. Ramona, welcome to this program. Hi, Bruce. Thanks so much for having me. It is my pleasure. Please take a minute or two and introduce yourself to our viewers. Hi, everyone. My name is Ramona Ferreira. And I am a social entrepreneur and the founder of Ohala Threads. Ohala Threads is a social enterprise based in the South Bronx in New York City. We design baby bodysuits inspired by indigenous Hispanic heritage, specifically the Taino community, which comes from Cuba, Puerto Rico, uh, Jamaica, and the Dominican Republic. And our body suits mean to create a intergenerational connection. What's really exciting about them though, is that customers have an opportunity to support a handmade product, which is finished here in the South Bronx, and also to make a donation to nonprofits that are supporting our community in a multiple, um, in multiple ways at their checkout point. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Fashion fascinates me because <clears throat> a few years ago, when I was with the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce and I wasn't coughing, I um, would uh, organize, for lack of a better word, a, um, I think it was a monthly meeting of our new members. And one of the members was in fashion, don't remember her name or the name of the company. And she said something that everybody did a double take and I asked her to repeat it because I didn't think I had heard her correctly. She said that she had made her dress out of recycled water bottles, plastic water bottles. It was the first time I ever saw a woman agree to let a bunch of men feel her dress without slapping their faces. Uh, and it felt like any other cloth. So that got me interested in the social component of fashion. Our topic is community building. So explain, how, I th you touched on it in the introduction, but explain how fashion leads to or contributes to community building. I think specifically for Ohala Threads, it was something that when I was designing my business plan, I chose to include in our corporate responsibility strategy. So when you look at early childhood development, it has been proven by sociologists that children who understand who they are, where they come from, and can articulate their identity and their heritage and that history tend to perform better um, in school and tend to be more successful throughout their lives. So something that's happened to the Taino community specifically and that we see um, even in, in the conversations of representation uh, that are happening throughout America now, is that we were raised being told that the Taino community was extinct after Columbus stopped in the Dominican Republic, which is not true. Um, genetically, we are still present. So as we grow up, we grow up looking like a mixture of different races and different places and aren't really told or, or no one really takes the time to explain that to us. As I was growing up, I felt a calling and a, a desire to identify with my indigenous identity. And there was really no place for me to go with that. So 
when I became an aunt um, and eventually took custody of my older nephew, I was living in Hawaii. I, I lived there for 10 years and I did my graduate schooling there, worked for the federal government there. And because I worked in community outreach and in disaster response, I got to work with Indonesia a lot. And there's a, a country that is fully invested and, and, and you know, committed to their identity and, and to their history. And when I would go there, I was fascinated by the textile history that they have there. And batik is one of the textiles that they make. And it is such an important aspect of, of their identity. And children are, are raised understanding that fabric and printing of this fabric is a component of who they are. My second nephew is then born um, a few years later. And at the age of four months, he comes down with meningitis. It was pretty bad. He ended up in the ICU. And at this point, I had returned um, to New York and I went out to New Jersey to help his mom. Um, she had been in the ICU with him for about four days and she was just exhausted. So my brother and her were like, hey, you know, you're obsessed with him. Can you please give us a break? So I ran to Jersey. I show up at the hospital and I stayed with him in the ICU. And I was, I was, you know, singing to him, singing to him one night, um, I remember thinking to myself, for indigenous communities like the Tainos, we believe that when you pass away, it is your ancestors that receive you. And Jadiel had received spinal taps, he had received, you know, experimental drugs, he had been at the brink of death, we were really worried about him. And I remember thinking, if he were to pass away during this episode, he would not know who's waiting for him. Because at four months, he hasn't met any of our elders. He hasn't met our family history. He has no idea who we are. And he got discharged from the hospital and I went home with him, stayed with him for a week. And during that week, I kept thinking like, how do I pass on the knowledge that I didn't tap into um, until I was in grad school and I was an adult? You know, how do I give a baby an understanding of their identity? And it came to me, you know, bodysuits, probably because I was changing his shirt, you know, 20 times a day because he's four months old. Uh -huh. um, and the next week I, you know, had an appointment with the SBA and I'm like, hey, this is my business idea. Do you think I should do this? Um, so how does that go into community building, right? So we have that aspect of community building it's the identity and us helping a generation, um, which I identify with, which is the first generation of American born immigrants that are descendants of, of the Taino people. And are Can here- Can you spell I'm, that for us? Taino? Yeah. T-A-I-N-O. Thank you. So, you know, for us, we're, we're the first ones born here in our family. We sort of live in this world where we don't feel comfortable there or here. Um, I spent my childhood in the Dominican Republic, and, and I always joke that when I speak in English, I, I sometimes slip up and I have to think because my first language was Spanish. Mm -hmm. And then when I go to the Dominican Republic, where I just came back from, I'm very purposeful and I speak even slower than most Dominicans do because my cousins would always make fun of me. They would always say, oh, there's the gringa, you know, she doesn't speak Spanish properly. So we, we're in this weird space where we don't um, really belong anywhere. And as we start having children and having nieces and nephews, we want to connect to that culture and to that identity. And baby clothing is the perfect way to do that. Um, because of my history, the second part would be after identity, because of my personal history working for the you know, Department of Defense and the FBI, I worked on community outreach and did some disaster response and disaster planning that made it easy for me to identify what kind of changes from a policy perspective my community needed to experience in order for us to thrive. Um, so the South Bronx is currently the poorest congressional district in America. So we had a, a deficit when it came to education, to health, to transportation, when I came back home, I felt like things were worse off than they had been a decade before. And I, I sat down and I was like, okay, if I was having a child, what would that child need in order to thrive in this community? 
and I slowly started working um, through activism and advocacy on different topics. So while my company is focused on fashion, I would show up, you know, in conversations about clothes Rikers. So what does clothes Rikers in that campaign have to do with baby products? 70% of folks that end up in Rikers or New York City jails come from my community or from one in Brooklyn. So the children that are in my community today in 17 years, if we don't do something about our criminal justice system through the legalization of marijuana, through the changes to bail, those are gonna be the children that are gonna end up in jail again, right? We're gonna be repeating these cycles. Um, I chose public transportation because when I came home, public transportation had peaked in this price where for folks like myself, who I have a disability, uh, my business is not, you know, it's not something that's raking in the cash. So I struggled at times to pay for my own transportation. And a lot of the youth in my community and, you know, sometimes adults would jump the turnstile or they would get on the bus without paying. And then that would lead to, you know, either a ticket or to a court appearance. So I fought for the half fare um, Metro card because it was important that everyone be able to afford public transportation. So I think those two are an example of like, how does something that is focused on, on fashion, like my, my passion is designing these pieces, but at the same time, if folks in my community are not thriving economically and are ending up in the criminal justice system, then who's consuming the goods that I'm making? Because they are my target market. And unfortunately, when I go into um, the marketplace, my price point, because of some of the decisions that I've made, like non-toxic ink and premium fabric, it does exclude my community at times. So my goal is to create an environment where my community can actually participate in the world of fashion that is sustainable. You know, they should be able to afford things that are not fast fashion. Um, the clothing that you see in my community tends to be from two extremes. Folks either go towards the high-end luxury goods, mm -hmm. which takes up an entire paycheck, or they're going towards the fast fashion, which is H&M, right? The H&M and the Zara's. So part of this education process of telling people there's a place in the middle where you're seen and you're valued because we know that a lot of the luxury brands don't really want to be portrayed in poor neighborhoods or by people of color. And then the fast fashion does so much damage to our environment. And we also suffer from environmental risk factors here with the asthma alley and, and with the Hunts Point and the trucking of the food. So it's this, it's this weird space where it would feel irresponsible for me as someone that's in fashion living in this community and that loves this community to not take into consideration my responsibility to the community as I'm developing the company. When you produce a bodysuit, that's the only thing you do? So we hand print the bodysuits here in the Bronx. And then we have some drop shipment items that we do occasionally uh -huh. that are not uh, made in New York. Okay. And then I have some uh, candles, which we just released. Um, they're spiritual okay. candles. And those are sourced from a spiritual shop here in New York as well. All connected, though, to your community. So they all are part of the Taino identity. Okay. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Do you include a brochure, some written information with each item explaining it, the connection to the community? Because a baby suit and a candle are two totally different things. That's a great question. So, you know, at moments when I feel like I'm going to throw in the towel, because last year we made $3,000 in sales, but got $10,000 in grants because of our community work. Um, what are you I, a nonprofit? No, so we are an S Corp and my goal is to become a B Corp. Um, but we've been able to apply for some grants that recognize small businesses uh, advocating oh. for their community. And we're lucky enough to earn um, two of them last year. So, 
part of the processing for me of each product is asking myself, because this is an educational venture as well, I have to educate my customer um, because not everyone knows what the Taino is or where they come from or, you know, what are their gods, what are their goddesses. And part of the bodysuit packaging is actual poetry that I write. So each poem will reflect what that bodysuit is trying to express. So our first design is actually inspired by folkloric dancing. So merengue, bachata, and folks know merengue and bachata, but the poem speaks about the slave trade and this hunger for gold and how that created this interesting mixture. And that mixture brings over then, you know, the African drums and mixes it with um, the Taino drum and then turns into this music and how when if you think of like the Puerto Rican Day Parade or the Dominican Day Parade, we're always wearing these white skirts with red and blue trimming. Okay. And it's, you can picture the flowing of the skirts. And it's something that anyone that has seen that parade Im immediately sees the bodysuit and is like, wow, I get it. Um, for the velones or, or the candles, these are candles that you would also find in the Catholic church because it's a seven day candle and I wanted to recognize, um, my grandmother passed away in December due to COVID complications. Back thank you so much. Uh, as I was learning my own history, uh, my grandmother grew up during the dictatorship in the Dominican Republic of Trujillo. And he was obsessed with being European. So he didn't allow folks to discuss um, being indigenous or to identify as indigenous. He was the president that changed this. So my okay. grandmother had no understanding of just how complex and beautiful that culture was. And every time I would learn something or read something, I would share it with her because I, I took care of her for the last three years. So when she passed away, I wanted to create something because I would go to the shop and I would buy the candles for her altar. And I was following you know, our Catholic tradition of, of setting up her altar and putting up flowers and I was buying these candles and it just didn't feel like enough. I wanted to incorporate our gods and our goddesses. And in the candle itself, it explains who this goddess is, which is Atabe, which is our mother earth. It explains um, what type of offerings you wanna make to her. And I also explain for each color of candle it's supposed to be used based on what need you have. So, you know, for if you go into like a Catholic spiritual shop or a botanica, which is where a lot of Latinos shop, um, you can find them in the Heights or in, in the Bronx anywhere. And like any Hispanic hub, there's a botanica. Um, this specific botanica is one of the oldest in New York City. And the candles all come already prepared for a specific purpose. So like the brown candle, is if you are looking to connect with your ancestors. So this last week I, I did a tutorial and I've been posting that slowly so that folks can understand. Um, I just got my grandmother's urn. It took a really long time for her urn to come in. I guess so many people are passing away that that's just taking longer than normal. So because I was putting her in her final resting place, I, I lit the candle and I did an offering ceremony and it's part of you know the education process. Mm -hmm because in, in addition to having this Catholic component to it, I'm making an offering of you know, dried shrimp and I'm offering dried plantain and dried fruits um, because these are things that the Tainos would have in their diet. So when folks see that, it just, it resonates on so many levels um, for them, but that education is necessary. And, and in my packaging and in my product description, it's necessary. Isn't there a contradiction and of course, I don't know. Um, so this is a question based, you know, coming from um, best of intentions and complete and total ignorance. Isn't there a contradiction between Catholicism and the belief in gods and goddesses? So there, there is, that is a valid question. Um, the real interesting thing is that when the Spaniards got to the Dominican Republic, there's a written account of this really important battle between the indigenous Taino folks and the Spaniards that happened in modern day La Vega. It's this um, city. And it, it happens at a high point 
where today there's this beautiful church that was built because of this battle. And the Tainos are winning and they're pushing back the Spanish and they rebelled and the Spanish are about to lose. And a miracle happens and St. Mary appears. And it's the, same, it's the first time that the Tainos have seen a saint appear. They assume she's a goddess. On the other side, when Bartolomé de la Casas and a lot of the um, friars that had accompanied um, the Spanish to the Dominican Republic and then throughout the Caribbean, start to interview the Tainos and talk to them about the gods and the goddesses, they start to translate the gods and the goddesses into modern day saints that are Catholic. So they say to them things like, well, don't worship this God because that's really this saint. So as I started learning more about my faith and, and, and not learning more about my faith, but I, I started uncovering more layers to my faith, the more I learned about being Taino because I was raised in the Catholic faith and, and especially with this Pope, I feel really connected finally to my Catholic faith. And it's not something I wanted to turn away from. Um, but so many things that Tainos would do in their rituals were then adopted by the Catholic faith. So some ways of chanting, um, some ways of offering, it's, it's, it becomes a blend and the friars themselves, which are Franciscans, um, because they were so in tune with nature, in a lot of the writings that they left behind, they, they tend to hint that it being so important that nature be core to our, 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 our belief system and our worship system within Catholicism, which is something that we hear Pope Francis say all the time. And, and for the Taino, nature was God nature was the ultimate. Um, so today you have things like um, the patron saint of Cuba, which is a, a, a actual form of the Virgin Mary, is a representation of an African deity, which is a mixture, which is then mixed with like a Taino um, image or an, a, a Taino description. So it becomes this really beautiful blend, which I think if you can appreciate it all without being judgmental, they can all coexist. In my home, I have rosaries. I have um, statues of the Virgin that I've collected from different countries. That's something that I like to do when I travel abroad, especially in Asia, like in China, like buying a Virgin in China is, is ultimate. Um, but at the same time, I have African orishas, and I have my Taino gods depicted. And I think the unifying message tends to be, you know, God created nature and it is sacred. So we should honor that. And that's a very indigenous perspective. It is very rare that I look at the clock and can't believe how much time has passed. <laughs> But that's the situation that I'm facing now. Uh, I do want to share one quick story. Yeah. 20 years ago, I was working at a nursing home and somebody did something stupid and nobody knew who and nobody knew what, but we all had to go to a cultural sensitivity program, which was three hours for one day. And it was one person, but we all had to go through it. And the facilitator puts signs on four up on the wall, four signs. Strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. And she asked the question, do you believe that race matters in interpersonal relations? And everybody went to no. Except, of course, for me. I went to yes, to strongly agree. And the facilitator looked at me with a smile on her face and said, Bruce, I don't think you understand the question. 
you're saying that race matters in interpersonal relations? And I said, absolutely. And I said, she goes, why? And I said, because unlike them, pointing to all my colleagues, most of whom knew me, some of whom didn't, but those who didn't know me were, I, I noticed that those who did know me were whispering to those who did know me, relax, he's okay. And I said, well, you know, unlike these people who are all racists and bigots, I'm not a racist or a bigot. And she looks at me and says, what are you talking about? I said, well, this one is saying that there is no Chinese uh, uh, heritage, there's no Chinese culture, there's nothing special about being Chinese. This one's saying there's nothing special about being Hispanic. This one's saying there's nothing special about being Black. This one's saying, and I went through all of them, and they all started to walk to my side of the room. Now, there was one woman who was, um, I couldn't figure out what race she was. And I just looked at her and said, and whatever in the world she is, you know, she doesn't have anything. Yeah, yeah. The next day, that woman, who was mixed race, obviously. Well, not obviously, but in this case, it was. Uh, it was. She came, she was waiting for me when I got to the office. Oh, because I said, and frankly, I think they're all anti-Semites because they're saying there's no Jewish culture, Jewish heritage, or history. She was waiting for me. She looked terrible because she hadn't slept all night. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, I was concerned all night that you thought I was an anti-Semite. Mm. And uh, this was in the days before HR went crazy. I said, come here. I gave her a hug. And I said, didn't think it for a moment. I was just trying to make my point. Yeah. And I understand that you growing up in a mixed race home cannot fathom the idea of race mattering. And just fine. But there are a lot of people out there, just so you know, that understand what you're trying to do and will be applauding. Because race does matter and culture does matter. And I commend you for what you're doing and the way you're doing it. Thank you. Final question, which I ask everyone. So if you don't know what's coming, that means you haven't watched the show before. Is there anything, oh, and by the way, I have had a cat on before. <laughs> I am a dog person. I appreciate your adding canine to the list of species who have participated in my <laughs> podcast. Don't care about race, care about species. Um, is there anything that I didn't ask you, which you wish I had asked you? Um, no, I think I think those were really good questions. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it was really good. Well, in that case, I will ask and show at the same time. This is the best way to get in touch. Yes. Well, I want to thank you, Ramona, for coming on. Thanks I've so much. enjoyed this conversation immensely, and I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Bruce Hurwitz. Thank you for watching, and please, as always, stay focused on success.